Um, I am going to take on a, a topic that is often of high interest to a lot of people when they approach the book of and with the passage of time, for some reason, increasingly um, higher interest. This, this idea of where did the Book of Mormon take place? Keep in mind, there are, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of models, external models, about where the Book of Mormon took place. And Theories. There are lots of uh, lots of models here in the Americas. Obviously, you've got the Peruvian and the Bolivian and the Chilean. You've got the Panama, the Nicaragua, the Honduras, the Costa Rica. You've got eight in Mesoamerica, at least. You've got Baja. You've got the two continent model. You've got uh, a couple of variations in the heartland of America. We've even got models over in Malaysia. We've got the Sri Lankan model, and the, I think the newest um, newest model on the scene is the African model. Some of you have maybe heard of that one. You can actually buy the book on Amazon. Really quickly, just a couple of numbers here. Um, you have, as was introduced in, in one of the opening sessions this morning, 268,000 words in the Book of Mormon. Now listen carefully. Out of 268,000 words in the Book of Mormon, we have approximately, this number's, you know, fudgeable depending on what you determine as, as a reference or not. You have 550 references to geography. In the book. 550 references out of 268,000 words. Let me put that in perspective. That's just over 0.2% of the book is focused on geography. Just over 0.2%, we're not even up at a percent of the book. And yet, many of the questions that arise, way more than 0.2% of our questions about the book, have to do with geography. Now, the problem with, um, with embarking on any discussion about geography is you've got various models, and any model you put up, you're going to make 95% of the rest of the audience upset. So what we've done with the with Taylor and, and I at BYU is the virtual scriptures group is we've tried to stay true to the, the church's position of neutrality as far as the, the geography is concerned. So we have been over and over and over again building on the, the backs of giants in this field who have gone before. John Sorensen and many others, uh, the Allens, and many, many years of research. And Jack 
which included a curved number beam. And what we've done is we've tried to create an internal model that would be beautiful for students of the rising generation. This is not appealing to, um, here's, here's the point. It doesn't matter which geograph geographical model in the external world you want to use. The fact is, based on what our first person accounts of the translation process say, they are telling us Joseph never used any resource material. No maps, no charts, no, no notes, no books, no resources off to the side. He is simply reading off of this, uh, off of the, um, the stones, these words, phrase by phrase by phrase, as we've already talked about. What I wanted to do for this is to show you that when you go through a, a, a Book of Mormon geography experiment like this, with an internal map, um, that can be, we fully intend for people not to like this, because this doesn't fit any external model. We get that. We're fully aware of that. What the intent is, is for you to be able to go through the Book of Mormon, regardless of what model you like or prefer, and squeeze, compress, twist, turn, stretch, do whatever you need to fit this into whatever model you prefer. But the reality is, is there are certain things the book says about its own geography that have to be in place. And some of them are pretty, um, pretty amazing. How Joseph, our, our frontier farm boy, who grew up and at age 23 he's doing this work without any notes of any kind or any references and spread it over all these months of translation and he's keeping things just incredibly consistent, and it fits beautifully with this story. Now, let me just take you through a couple of stories. We'll do the uh, um, the weatherman here. We've got a high-pressure system moving in from the east. No, I'm just uh, what we're going to show is where geography doesn't get in the way, but where it can actually enhance our understanding and unlock principles. Now, brothers and sisters, if geography were not at all important, I don't think Mormon or Moroni or Nephi would have included anything of the geography. But when they do include it, I'm forced to conclude to say, hmm, there's probably a reason they chose to tell me this or give me this geographic detail here to whatever detail level they give it. So, I'm going to take Nephi seriously when he says, and I did liken all scriptures unto us that it might be for our profit and learning. And I'm going to do that with this 0.2% of the Book of Mormon that refers to geography and see if there are lessons we can learn. I totally understand that this is not going to be, in this aspect, it's not going to be scholarly or academic in nature. It's very, very um, application based. But brothers and sisters, I find that uh, the Holy Ghost, for me personally, doesn't usually bear testimony quite as strongly of 
questions of curiosity or details of geography as much as eternal truths that help me understand principles of the plan of salvation better and understand the Savior at a deeper level and feel like I want to be more like him. When you look at the very existence of the Nephites and the Lamanites in the land southward, it's divided very clearly in the text that Zarahemla is north, Nephi is south, and yet every single time you go from Nephi to Zarahemla, you're going to go down, and every single time, without exception, perfect consistency, from start to finish, if you're going from Zarahemla to Nephi, you're going up going totally contrary to, to what Joseph should have written, being north, up, south, down. Even in the 19th century. But no, the Nephites and the Lamanites are not basing their geography off of 21st or 19th century um, directionality. So here you have them, boots on the ground, no satellite imagery, no, no Google Earth to rely upon. They're just based on what they can see. And so as you get into the Book of Mormon uh, chapters regarding war, for instance, you can see some incredible lessons for life if you back out and let the geography teach a few lessons at an application level. For instance, What if you consider for a moment, just open up the possibility that the land of Zarahemla where the Nephites lives could represent us, our, our existence on this earth, and our efforts to try to, to live the gospel, and the Lamanites being that opposition that keeps coming to try to destroy us, try to enslave us, try to get us to fall to their subjection, take over our agency, being kind of in that part of the book, it's going to switch in the book of Helaman, but in this part of the book, this, this element of, of opposition in our life. Well, if that's the case, then what you have in Alma chapter 43 through 51 is Captain Moroni showing you all of these principles of what a Latter-day Saint could do to try to resist temptation and sin and to try to repel it and keep it out. And so every effort that these Lamanites bring into taking over the Nephites, Captain Moroni repels them. Even though they're outnumbered, he repels them. And now Malachi comes in chapter 51, and he enters at Antionum, in league, obviously, with some king men who have started to create this problem internally with the Nephites. Because if it isn't for the internal struggles, Captain Moroni is going to, going to keep increasing the fortifications and be totally fine. But because we brought all of our forces to this civil war, now Malachi picks up the, uh, the fight in chapter 51. That which used to be our strength is now being used against us.